so that he might change your heart and transform your mind. Uh, it's good to be here once again to magnify the Lord, to, to lift up his glorious and wonderful name. Uh, we are glad that you're here once again uh, to, be, to be with us. I want to take you to a, a rather unique passage of scripture. You're like, Derek, that doesn't surprise us at all after just a few Sundays. But I want to take you to 1 Kings, the 11th chapter. 1 Kings, the 11th chapter, and we'll begin reading at verse number 14. We're reading through uh, verse 25 as we, as we look at, 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 this, at this word. There's something I believe that we need to understand as believers. There's something I believe that we need to embrace as children of God. And it's a very simple pre principle. And that is that God doesn't merely save us just to give us a pass for heaven. God doesn't merely just save us so that we can, we can sit on the sidelines and wait for the great trumpet sound so that we can go be with him. But God saves us so that we can step into his life, so that we can step into his path, so that we can be a part of the kingdom of God and all that he's doing and all that he's accomplished in our life. And I believe time and time again in the word of God, we see we see principles and patterns that we can see in the Word of God that constantly echoes that to us and constantly shows us how we as children of God can live. So let's read, uh, read that uh, text here in uh, chapter 11, verse 14. It said, Now the Lord raised up an adversary against Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was a descendant of the king in Edom. For it happened when David was in Edom and Joab, the commander of the army, had gone up to bury the slain after he had killed every male in Edom. Because for six months Joab remained there with all Israel until he had cut down every male in Edom. That Hadad fled to go to Egypt, he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him. Hadad was still a little child. Then they rose from Midian and came to Paran. And they took men with them from Paran and came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house, apportioned, appointed food for him, and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so he gave him, uh, gave him as wife the sister of his own wife, that is the sister of Queen Tapanese. Then the sister of Tapanese bore into him Ganubath, his son, uh, whom Ta Ta Tapanese weaned in Pharaoh's house, and Ganubath was in Pharaoh's house among the sons of Pharaoh. So when Hadad heard in Egypt that David rested with his fathers, and that Joab the commander of the army was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me depart, and I, I may go to my own country. Then Pharaoh said to him, but what have you lacked with me that suddenly you seek to go to your own country? So he answered, nothing, but do let me go anyway. And God raised up another adversary against him. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a little too far. We're going to stop at verse, at verse number uh, 22 there. I want to speak simply from this thought this morning, out of obscurity out of obscurity. Father, we ask for your grace in this place this morning. We ask that you teach us. We ask that you reveal your heart to us, Lord God. We ask that you, through your word, Lord Jesus, would manifest, Lord G Jesus, your purpose, your plan, your will, Lord, for what you have in store for us, God. God, lead us this very day, God. I believe there, there may be very well some hey dads in this very room, God. We pray that you would stir our hearts and our minds to be obedient servants of the Most High God. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen and amen. I remember the very first time that I came across this passage of Scripture. All of a sudden, I began to believe that it was a sidebar. I believe that it may be a side note, just a little detail that wasn't really that important, but that the writer kind of threw in. And I, I began to see Haydad as one of those as one of those characters that was somewhat like an extra on on the on the set, and he was just there to to pass by and and us not pay much attention to him. But as I began to consider it and begin to think about it, I come to realize something. We believe that this book is the Word of God. From cover to cover, we believe that it's God speaking to us and God speaking through His Word. So if we're sensitive to what God is saying, that we can take those little areas that we think are sidebars, they're not sidebars at all, those little areas that we think might be just a minor detail, and they really can speak to our hearts, and they can really 
speak to our minds. So as I begin to look at this, I begin to realize that God may be wanting to say something to us in this story of this king of Edom by the name of Hadad. And as I looked at this, I realized that here in the, in the word of God is the roots of one of the most brilliant plots and storylines anywhere. If you've watched movies for any time at all, I, I'm, I'm one that I like kingdoms. I like kings and knights and, and, and I, like, I like to see that, see that in my movies. And if you watch many of them, you've heard this plot before. You've realized that oftentimes the, the plot goes something like this. A king marches into a kingdom. He conquers that, that nation. He conquers that people. And in conquering that people, he turns around and he goes into the palace and he eliminates, completely eliminates the royalty in that place. But somehow, some way, a group of men grabs that child and runs for the back door with that child. And they take him off into a foreign land and a foreign nation. And those group of men begin to train him up and begin to teach him the ways of royalty. They begin to teach him the ways of battle and the ways of, of fight. And then one day, seemingly out of nowhere comes that young man riding back in his horse with all the men behind him and he takes his place back on the throne he defeats his enemies and he conquers and he and, and the people are, are just are just thrilled by the fact that their kingdom is once again established a brilliant plot so brilliant that Hollywood has borrowed it again and again and and again we see it they didn't start they didn't originate it let me tell you it was actually true events that it took place in God's word here in the word of God it was such a brilliant plot that Jesus himself followed it if you know, remember when Herod come in and he eliminated the the babies and he tried to tried to kill all the the children in in Bethlehem to get to this king that he had just heard about but that night before the Joseph had seen a vision from the angel and he said take him to Egypt isn't it funny he sent him right to the very same place that Hadad had been taken he said take him to Egypt and then when he got a little older and he heard that someone had died just like Hadad he came back where he would establish his kingdom. He came back where he had sat on his throne. He came back where he established a kingdom that would never have an end. What a glorious story there. You see, this is not just a story in the Bible. This is a shadow of what was to come. And his name was Jesus Christ, the one that stepped out of the obscurity on to the very scene uh, for us all. And, and as we look at this, at this word, we, I begin to realize something, that obscurity seems to play a major role in each of these events. And we see that oftentimes when God uses great people throughout history, that God is almost always brings them through the university of obscurity. He seems to almost always bring them through a period a point in their lives where they seem to be unseen, unknown, in the shadows somewhere, on the sidelines, considered to be unimportant in their life. But all of a sudden, they, they break onto the scene. And people are like, where did Elijah come from? They said, where did Moses come from? Where did Paul come from? Where did this man called Jesus come from? Well, they came out of obscurity to fulfill the purpose and the plan of Jesus Christ. You might recognize this plot too in, the, in, in a message I preached a while back uh, about Mephibosheth. How Mephibosheth was, was captured away. And, and, and his end was a little bit different in that he come into David's house. And that's, that story was there to illustrate for us God's grace upon our life. But I believe Hadad's story is there to illustrate for you and for me the place that God's purpose has in our life. How many of you know that you were born into the kingdom of God for a purpose? You were born into the kingdom of God to know that God's, that God's will would work in your life, in, 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 in your heart. So I want you to notice this morning for just a few minutes, I want you to notice the process that Haydad begins to reveal to us about how God takes us through one step after another step, bringing us into where we need to be purposefully, where we need to be in fulfilling the call that God has placed in our lives and in our hearts. Eric, would you move to the next slide, please? The very first thing that I want you, I want you to notice is... Uh, one more, one more slide there, is the refining that takes place. The refining that takes place in, in our life. Notice verse 14, if you will. He introduces this King Hadad by, using a, a, by saying that God raised up 
certain adversaries against Solomon. Solomon had gone his own way. Solomon had decided that after being a wise king and a wise ruler and blessed by God and giving the wisdom of God, that he was going to take wives of other kingdoms. And not only that, he was going to adopt their religion and adopt their worship. And as he began to do that, God began to stir up these men, these kings in other company, in other countries to come against him and to, and to be an agitant, uh, agitation to him. So here in the word of God, we see that God's word said that God had raised up these adversaries. In, in, in certain translations, in, in certain uh, phrases, that word literally means to be stirred up. It, it, the picture that it draws is of somebody sleeping. You know, you're right in the middle of just a wonderful nap, and that crash happens in the kitchen, or, or something takes place, uh, and, and you, it startles you awake, and you can't, you're not going back to sleep. That's, the, that's the, what that word stirred uh, simply means. It means to be stirred from dormancy unto action. And so here in the word of God, we see that this man called Hadad had become stirred into action. Action. And this was not something that happened overnight. It looks like it in our life. When we see people that are stirred and pushed into ministry or pushed into some purpose in their life or pushed into some giftings, we think it happened overnight. But this actually was a process that took place over years of time. Let me tell you, that's what happens when God saves us. When God delivers us from a life of sin and he puts us in his life and he puts us on his path and he puts us on his way. He puts us on a crash course with refining. That's where he begins to shape us and where he begins to mold us and where he begins to remake us in his image and in his way. You see the shadows, that, those, those hidden places are where God seems to like to do his best work. That's where God seems to like to move among us and and touch us in our life. That undercurrent of what he is doing in your life. That undercurrent of what he is revealing in your life. And so often because it's not seen. We have the tendency to believe that it's not to be appreciated. Because it's not applauded. Because others are not recognizing it. Because others are not saying yeah that's what I need to be. That's what I need to be and that's what I need to do. We can, we can fall into the habit of believing that it's unimportant in our life. There is no more important work than God is doing on you than what he's doing in you. There is no more important work that he is doing to prepare your life and to shape your life and to set you up. For how he wants to use you. More than doing those dark seasons. Doing, doing those dark times. Oh why did the Lord let me go, make me go through that? I'll tell you why. Because he's in the process of refining you in your life. I heard one minister say. Sometimes we pray too often for God to change our circumstances when all the while God is out to change us with our circumstances. He's, he's there to refine us and to make us the children of God that he intended us to be. Now we all love that verse in Romans 8, 28 that say that we know that all things work together for the good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. And, and too often I've heard that applied universally. We all heard it. Everything happens for a reason. That's not Bible, by the way. Oh, you know, it's all going to work out. It's all going to work. It's not going to work out for just everybody. I'm sorry. That's not what Paul was saying. Paul says, God is at work in the lives of people who love God and are in the purposes of God. So the more we align our lives to his purpose, the more we align our lives to loving him, the more we align our lives to those things. He's not all about our dreams. He's not all about our vision. He's about his dream and his vision. But let me tell you, you've never had a dream so big as he's had. You've never had a vision so big that, that he's had. And I count it as a privilege to be able to say, Lord, help me to be a part of what you're doing in my life, in my heart. So we need to realize that those shadows are there to shape us, to mold us, and to make us. Now, you know, I know preaching, preaching like this, oftentimes people say, well, that's for you preachers. That's for you missionaries. That's, that's, that's for people that, that sing. That's for people that, that lead in, in, in some significant way. Do you know that Haydad wasn't a prophet? Do you know that Haydad wasn't a priest? Do you know that Haydad was a politician in a foreign land that didn't believe in God, didn't trust in God? But God used him. Too often in our lives we begin to believe that, that, that because the call upon our life is unconventional that it's not anointed. I am of the conviction, the firm conviction that God needs some anointed carpenters. I'm in the firm conviction that God 
need some anointed doctors. How many of you want to go under the blade with somebody that doesn't, is not anointed by God? Not me. I, I believe that God wants some anointed nurses, some anointed teachers, some anointed people in their life. We should never limit the call of God upon what we see on Sunday mornings, but we should say, Lord God, use me every day of the week. Use me in every way that you have for my life. Because you see, in that refining, God is refining you. Not just anybody, but he's refining you to be what he would have you to be. Also in that refining time, if you'll notice in Hadad's experience, that when Hadad left, left Edom and headed to Egypt, he did not leave alone. God surrounded him with a group of people. God surrounded him with individuals that would shape him and mold him and make him. I can testify to the fact all along your walk with God, God will bring people into your lives that will refine you. Some for the good, some for the bad. What? That person that annoys you at work, they're there to refine you. They're there to bring that junk to the surface so that the Holy Spirit can deal with it. And, and use it. God will surround your life with individuals that are meant to help shape you according to the purpose and the plan that God has for your future and that God has for your life. And let me tell you something else. You are one of those people. God has called each of us to prod each other along. God has called each of us to encourage that individual, to encourage that coworker, to encourage that person in the Lord so that they may they go on to be everything that God would have for them to be. So the most, one of the most vital parts of this whole thing is that we need to surrender, to surrender to God's, God's uh, refining in our life. Also, we need to surrender to the redefining. Eric, could you uh, to go to this? To, to the redefining in our life. You see, uh, uh, can we go on to the next slide? Thank you. That redefining uh, uh, in, our, in our life. The greatest obstacle is not your circumstances. The greatest obstacle for you being all that God would have you to be is not what, where you found, where you live, how much money you make. It's none of those things at all. One of the greatest obstacles to you being what God would have you to be in the living out his fullness for your life is, that, is, the, is what you allow to define you. What you allow to say who you are and what you are in, in your life. As I, as I looked at this, I began to realize that the process that Hadad had gone through was a process of redefining. Now, I, believe, I personally believe that COVID is a season of redefining. If I've ever seen a season of redefining, I'm seeing people quit jobs they had for 30, 40 years. I've seen people walk away from lives and, 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 and paths that they've, they've held. And you, it, had COVID never happened, I don't think they would have ever lost, lost those, left those. The great resignation, they're calling it. Because I believe people are faced with a redefining moment in their lives. I believe the church is facing a redefining season. We've had to learn how to do church all over again. We've had to learn how to do church when we couldn't have church. We, we, we learned how to, how to be a, a family and a, a, a people of God even when everything is turned upside down. And I believe it's not just because the devil's at work. I believe God's going to use it. I believe God's going to transform it. To shake some people and to say, I want you to, to realize what is defining you. And I want you to throw out what is not to define you. And I want you to embrace what is defining you. So what is it that shouldn't define us, Derek? First of all, our past failures shouldn't define us. Have, you, have anybody been to a, a circus or a zoo recently? Oh, good, good. Have you ever seen that big old elephant, huge elephant? You know, the, the, the size of a Mack truck standing there. But there's this tiny little spike that is driven in the ground that's holding him. And you think, why doesn't that elephant just take off running? Why didn't he just, just uh, twist that leg and cause that spike to come up? What you, what you don't understand is what the trainers of elephants had come to understand. When an elephant is a baby elephant, a small elephant, they'll find a spike that will hold him. Then they'll go out and they'll drive that spike in the ground and they'll attach his leg to it and he can fight and he can, he can, he can struggle with, with that, that, that stake for, 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 for all day long if he, he, if he wants to. After a while he gets it. This is, not, this is not letting me move. This is not letting me have. But then as that elephant grows bigger and bigger, they don't change the spike. 
they just keep attaching it bigger and bigger to, to his. Because you see, the memory of an element remembers, I can't pull this spike up. I can't get away from this thing. I see too many believers who's allowed somebody yesterday, somebody in their past, somebody, but defined them in a certain way that has nailed it into the ground and they've been content to live with that de de defining. When I'm here to tell you that as a child of God, you don't have to be defined by your past failures. You don't have to be defined by your past sins. You don't have to be defined by you being born on the wrong side of the tracks. You don't have to be defined by those things. Because God's grace says that you are more than that in your life. Hadad could have been defined by the failures of his, of his family, but he, he did not allow it to happen. He, he said, no, I'm not going to be defined by that, and he moved on. We can also, and here's the surprising one, we can also be defined by our past successes. I don't believe there's any greater test of who you are and what you are than success. You want to see what somebody's made up? Promote them. You'll see what's in their heart. You'll see what's, what's, what's in their life. Give them more. Give them more responsibility. Give these. There's some people that they don't, they can't handle authority. They can't handle success in their life. We've got to be careful lest we allow success to define who and what we are. Hadad succeeded in, a, in Egypt. He succeeded uh, to, to, to have riches. His child ran the halls of the Pharaoh's palace. He, he could go into the Pharaoh's presence at any time, at any, any point of the day. Why? Because God had blessed him and God had touched him. And sometimes I believe as Christians, we believe that if God is blessing us today, it's for today. When it might be for tomorrow. Where it might be for your next assignment. Where it might be to, to be able to invest in what he has in your life. So we should never allow ourselves to be defined by our past successes. I've known people that's, that has walked away from God because they got a promotion. I've known people who have stopped serving God because they, they got a raise in their paycheck. I know people that, that have walked away from God because they let their success define them. One of my favorite quotes is from Francis Chan that said this. He said, our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. I believe there's going to be some successful people stand before Jesus and say, my life was wasted. Why? Because not because I was doing wrong, but because I was missing what you had in my life and my heart. So we should never let success define us. We should never let others define us. <laughs> That's a big one in our life. You see, not everybody's going to be applauding your decision to do what God wants you to do in, in your life. I see it in verse, verse 21 and 22. We see the conversation between, between uh, Hadad and the Pharaoh, I mean, this is not just a small guy. This is the Pharaoh of, of Egypt talking with him saying, don't leave. You don't need to leave. Hadn't I given you everything that, 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 that I that promised you? He was discouraging him, but there was something going on in the heart, something going on in the mind of Hadad that caused Hadad to say, no, I will not be defined with what, who other people think I am. I will not be defined by what other people applaud in my life, in my heart, because there's a greater calling on my life that God has in store for me. We need to realize that in our life. We need to realize that not every one of your friends are going to applaud you of following after God. And not everyone that tries to discourage you is 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 hating you. When I came to Freeport, I had some friends that said, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. Why do you need to do that? You could stay here and, and we, there's opportunities here that could, could bless you. But you see, I want to tell you, there was something inside this old boy that said, no, no, I want to, I want to pursue God with all that I have. And I sincerely believe that God has anointed us and enabled us for the future of, of, of Freeport. And, and so we need to realize that not everyone's going to agree with you. So don't let your life be defined by other people. Well, then Derek, in that case, what, what, it, what should define my life? Well, that's, that's a, quite an easy one. You see, the same things that defined Hadad and redefined Hadad is what redefines us. First of all, he was defined by the call of royal blood. Although Hadad had been raised in Egypt, Hadad never felt like he was an Egyptian. It sound familiar? <laughs> Although he was raised in, in a foreign kingdom, in a foreign land. 
among the foreign people, he realized that there was blood flowing through his veins now that was the blood of a king and that, he, that that blood kept stirring within him. That blood kept calling out to him. There's a job to do, son. There's a, there's a work to do. Let me tell you, I'm so glad that I was called into another kingdom. I'm so glad that from the time that I said yes to Jesus Christ, that he gave me the power to be the very sons of God. I am royal blood. You are royal blood. And because we're royal blood that should define us that should be what we say yes to that should be what we what we should live for because let me tell you when it's all said and done when when, when you breathe your last breath it's not going to matter what kind of house you got it's not going to matter what kind of car you got it doesn't matter all your accomplishments in the business world only thing will matter be what you've accomplished for the kingdom of God what you've done for his work and in his in his is his way that is the only thing that should define us is the royal blood of Jesus Christ Christ and on top of that we need to be defined by the kingdom of God we need never to forget that we are citizens of heaven <laughs> I love that I love that from the time that Jesus came down and walked he said the kingdom of heaven of God is near you in other words, it's here. The king had arrived and everybody that follows and bows to the king finds themselves uh, identified by the kingdom of God uh, years ago, how many of you remember the Reagan administration? If you don't want to show your age, just, just, just keep your hand down. Keep your hand down. Remember George, George Schultz. He was the Secretary of State. Well, he, he had a practice that he did with all of his foreign ambassadors. He would bring them into his office. He would stand there before a globe and he'd spin that globe and he'd say, show me your nation. And every one of them would walk up and the, the ambassador to China would walk up and stop and, mat, and point to China. The, the ambassador to Costa Rica would, would spin it and he'd, he'd stop the globe. He'd find Costa Rica. And almost in every instance, George Schultz would say, you're wrong. That is not your nation. Your nation is been, should always be, and will forever be the United States of America. He said, and although you're in those foreign lands, you always speak for the uh, United States. You always act in a manner, a, a, a way that is representative of the United States. Well, our word, God's word tells us that we are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. That we are a part of another, another kingdom. Although I may have been born and raised in South Carolina. That surprises you, I know. <laughs> Although I was born and raised in, in South Carolina, I am not a citizen of South Carolina. Although I'm an American and, and I'm glad that God planted me in this wonderful country, I don't consider myself a, a, a totally a, allegiant to this nation. This nation turns against God. I turn against this nation. Why? Because I'm from a different kingdom. I'm from a different land. I'm from a different world. A kingdom that will never have an end. And when heaven and earth passes away, when the nations pass away, we will still be standing saying, I am so glad that I define myself not by my lineage, but I define myself by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I define myself by the kingdom of God in my life and in my heart. So God wants to take us through, through a refining. God wants to take us through a redefining in, in our life. I like, I like that. I, I've been redefined again and again. Just when I think I've, I've got it down, Mike, it's just, the Lord just comes back and says, Boom. you know, no, no, that's not who you are. This is who you are. This is what the word of God has, has, has to say about your life. So we need a refining and we need a redefining. Eric, could you move to the third point? Because all of it is leading to the unveiling in our life. To that point in our life that just like the, the ones in this story, just like the ones uh, like Haydad, we see that God's bringing us to a point where he can shine through us. There is no greater time in the history of this nation, I believe, for child, children of God. For the kingdom of God to rise up than now in this period. There's no time greater for light than in the middle of darkness. There's no time greater uh, th than hope in the middle of despair. There's no time greater for any of those things. But it, it takes men and women, boys and girls, that'll say, Lord God, I, I believe you saved me. Not, not so that I can sit on a bench and ride my way to heaven, but that you've saved me so that I can make a difference in my co-workers' lives. You've saved me so, Lord God, I can, I can see change in my city. You've saved me, Lord God, so that I can see my family come to know you and to trust you. You save me, Lord God, so that they can be that unveiling in my life where they see who I am and who I was born again to be. You see, something happened with Hadad. 
That stirring took place in his life. That stirring that he wouldn't allow others to discourage him from. That stirring took place that he wouldn't allow, uh, that we would, he wouldn't allow all the things that once defined him to define him anymore. Because he realized something. He was on a collision course with God's timing. And when you begin, when you, uh, when God is ready to use you, when God is ready to work through you, when God is ready to do his greatest work in you, there will be a time when you will collide with God's timing. You may, you may think everything's going fine, everything's going well, then all of a sudden there's a door that opens. All of a sudden there's an avenue that takes place. All of a sudden there's an opportunity that happens that shows you that all the while God has just been preparing me for this very moment in my life. Mordecai looked at, at, at his niece oh Esther who, who, who were saying I, I just don't know what to do Mordecai I just don't know how to live Mordecai if I go before the king without being invited I'm gonna die I, I, I'm, I, I, I feel like I got to get out of this comfort zone but it may cost me my life and I like what Mordecai said who knows my child that this may be the very time that you were born from for such an hour as this that God may be blessing no Esther you weren't blessed so that you could be a beautiful queen no you weren't blessed so that you could sit on a wonderful throne no you weren't blessed for all those things you were blessed that all the while it was refining all the while it was a redefining all the while it was all these things bringing you up to the very moment that I'll use you bringing you up to the very moment that I'll unveil you for all to see I'd let me tell you Jesus likes nothing more than to unveil his children of God upon this earth Jesus likes nothing more than to shine through you and to be Jesus to, to your neighbors and your friends and your neighborhood God wants to do a great unveiling in our lives and in our hearts and that means a sudden a sudden collision with time it also means when we begin to enter into the empowering found only in God's plan see the disciples understood something they understood that when they gave their life to Jesus they did just that they gave their life to Jesus you know, I, I believe that we learn stuff from other people's lips that they don't really mean to communicate to us. And since a little boy, I always hear this testimony. Y'all remember the testimony services in church? Oh, that could go on for hours. <laughs> sometimes they were great. Sometimes they were not so, not so great. But, the but most everybody said the same thing about salvation as I was growing up. And they were saying this thing. I remember the day when I invited Jesus into my life and he changed my life. And I began to look at the, the New Testament. I began to realize that the New Testament church would have never used that terminology. Because to the New Testament church, they saw Christ salvation as a different way. What do you mean, Derek? They would, here would probably be their testimony from what I could tell. I remember the day when Jesus invited me into his life and I embraced his life and I followed after him. You see, one of them says he's a part of my life. Another says I'm a part of his life. One of them says he's an appendage that blesses me sometimes. He's there when I need him sometimes. He's there. He's there. He's on the shelf if I ever need my Lord, my God. But another one says, oh, I'm going to give my life to you, Lord Jesus. I'm going to be everything that you've called me to be, Lord God. My life belongs to you. That's what Paul meant when he said you're bought with a price. You are not your own anymore. Jesus is calling the church back to that realization. Back to that reality that he has a plan for us. That he has a plan for his people. That he might change us and to transform us. Years ago there was a, a famous burglar by the name of Maxwell White. Maxwell White was known for some of the great burglaries uh, on Long Island and, and he, he, his burglaries were so bad that the man was sentenced to 99 years in prison. And in prison in 99 years he had served 33 years of his life and a reporter decided to interview him and ask him a few questions. And the reporter sat down and one of the first questions that the reporter asked to him, he said who did you rob from the most? And without hesitation Maxwell White looked through that through those bars and he said I robbed from me the most he said I robbed 33 years so far of my life I robbed a future from me I robbed a purpose for me I should have not been a burglar I could have been anything else I could have been I could have been great I could have been wonderful let me encourage you this morning don't let 
anyone rob you of God's purpose for your life. Don't let anyone stand in the way. Don't let anything, don't let your culture define you. Don't let your age define you. Oh, I'm getting gray hair. I've been getting gray hair for a long time. <laughs> I'm getting gray hair. But it's not, it's not, it's not, should never define us. Because let me tell you, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And if God calls you to it, he'll get, take you through it. And he'll, he'll bring victory like you've never known or never experienced in your life. Don't let anything rob you of, of what he has for you. Because God wants to call us out of obscurity. God wants to call us off the bench. God wants to call us out of the sidelines. He wants to call us out of the shadows so that we can say yes to his purpose and yes to his plan. God's got a plan for you and I say that without shuddering one bit. God's got a plan for you in Freeport, Illinois. God's got a plan for you in your, in your life. Why? Because that's just how God works as we see it in Haydad's life. There is a refining that will take place. There is a redefining that will take place. And there's an unveiling when God shows the world that you're a part of what he's doing. Oh, that's, that's powerful. Would you stand with us this morning? Here's the reality. The creator of the universe has chosen you to be a part of what he's doing. There's nobody that's ever given you that kind of opportunity. There's nobody that's ever, that's ever opened such a door in your life and, 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 and your future than what he has. I've seen people come from out of nowhere. <laughs> what? I thought you were a plumber. <laughs> but, but now you're doing this, this for the Lord. And, and it's not that plumbing was bad. It was just that plumbing wasn't their place that God wanted them to be used in. And how God wants to work through them. If you're in this house this morning. <clears throat> or if you're watching online and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your life really hasn't started yet. Why? Because if you let him, he'll invite you into his life. He'll invite you into his purpose. He'll invite you into his plan. Years ago, the preacher got up and preached a sermon and said, there's never been anyone in this generation that has ever given their hearts and their strength and their abilities to God 100%. He said, that saddens me. And at that moment, a little boy walked forward, fell in the altars before his face before God, and in sobbing and crying, he said, Lord, I promise you, I'll give you me, all of me. And little Dwight L. Moody uh, determined to give his, the, all of his heart to Jesus Christ. And you know what happened? He shook this nation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If, if you would this morning, if, if this morning you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I don't believe in secret saints. Okay? I'm not going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes, throw, throw up a pinky. I believe, that, I believe that there should be a confession that you say, I choose Jesus. And I choose to follow after you, Lord. If you're in this house and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you just step out this morning? Would you just come around here? We'd this church would love to pray to help you pray through to the to salvation of grace in Jesus Christ. That you might be able to say, yes, Lord, this very day. Is there one? Is there one? If you're online this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's time to start living. It's time to say yes to what he has for you. Yes to his plan. Yes to his will. Yes to what he wants you to do. It's time to start a process that will take you throughout all eternity in your life. If you don't know him right where you are, you can say yes to Jesus. You can ask him to forgive you of your sins. You can commit to following after him. You can commit to giving the whole of your life to who he is and to what he is, is for you. And you can watch him change you and transform you and start you in a process that will forever refine you. God is up to something in this generation. I want to be a part of what God is up to. If you're in this house this morning, you say, well, Derek, I, I, just, simp I just simply want to recommit myself to his plan.
I just want to recommit myself to his definition. To, would you just raise your hand to him so that he might be may, may able to see and say, Lord God, here I am. Use me. Here I am. Send me. Here I am, Lord God. Transform me. Here I am, Lord God. Use me in my neighborhood. Use me on the job. Use me, Lord God, in every way, Lord Jesus, that you possibly can because <clears throat> time is running short. Jesus says, work now. Work now while it's day because night's coming where no man can work. I don't know about you. I don't want to stand beside Peter, James, and, and John and say, well, I went to church on Sunday. <laughs> I want him to be able to say, let me tell you about what God has done in my life. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we are thankful. Lord God, we are we are. <clears throat> Lord, we are so humbled by the reality of the fact that, Lord Jesus, you have called us into your plan. You have called us into your purpose, God. You have called us to be shaped and molded and made, Lord God. Lord God, I believe with all my heart there's, there's some haydads in this room, Lord God, that don't even realize it like haydad didn't realize it, but that you're shaping them, that you're molding them, that you're making them for something great, God. You're making them, Lord Jesus, to accomplish what you've called for them to do to be who they were born again to be lord god we pray lord jesus that you'll anoint us we pray lord jesus that you'll enable us we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would stir our hearts and our minds. Lord Jesus, we pray for this church, God. Oh, Lord God, for this open Bible church in Freeport, Illinois, that, Lord Jesus, we might be a people about the Father's business. That we might be a people, Lord Jesus, that have committed to loving you, to committed to pursuing you, to committed, Lord Jesus, to be in everything that you have for us to be and everything that you have for us to do. Go with us, Lord God, this week. Lord Jesus, make yourself known in our lives this week, Lord Jesus. If there's sickness, bring healing, God. If there's hurt, bring healing, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, if there's need, provide. And we'll ask you all in Jesus' glorious name. And the church said, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming this morning.